Hi everyone, I'm Alex. And I'm Michaela. And today we have a second episode of a series Computers of Chernobyl, a series where we explore and study the history of the data processing and using of the computer equipment in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. In the previous episode, we told the story of YES 1841, a Chernobyl computer used for research works in post-disaster Pripyat. In this episode, we will share some amazing discoveries about what was possible to build based on this computer. Well, we knew that it will be possible to do pretty much, but we could not imagine it was this much. Before we continue, don't forget to subscribe and check our Patreon page. For a price of just a couple of cups of coffee, you can get access to the longer version of this and our future videos. And also, you will greatly help us with our future hardware experiments. As many great stories in Chernobyl, everything started here also with just one single piece of paper. One day, when I was exploring the Jupiter plant in Pripyat, I found something. That was a reference for a proposed radiation monitoring system that integrated YES1841 computer with the analog board that was coded 0100. The system had to look kind of this way. The system unit of YES1841 provides by standard just three voltages, which were insufficient to power any instruments. There had to be used an expansion unit that looked pretty similar, but it had a power supply with additional polar 15 volts voltages. It had to be connected to the main one using a couple of boards that made an ISA bridge expanding the system bus. Inside the expansion unit, an analog input-output board had to be installed, and then, already to this board, you connect the instruments. For example, some radiation detectors. They give a signal, the board converts it, the software processes it. It was interesting, but we didn't have any more details about this hardware. Therefore, when the yes came to us, we decided to revive our story. To find out more, we went to the cradle of the Ukrainian computer science, the Cybernetic Center. This place is a home for a group of fundamental research facilities. Among them is the Institute of Cybernetics, founded by the father of the Ukrainian IT, Viktor Glushkov. Here we met Doctor of Engineering, Professor Volodymyr Romanov, who actually designed the model 0100. He works at the Institute already for more than 50 years, so the talk went far beyond our initial questions. Professor Romanov shown us the engineering prototype of the actual model that back in the 80s he made on his own, and there are even some original wired corrections on its back. The board has 8 input and 2 output channels and may accept signals with a frequency up to 50 kHz. You could get a digitalized parameters of the signal to the computer and mm, say impulses from the radiation detection block or something more complex. Or opposite, you could generate the signal based on the desired digital parameters. Needless to say, we were quite shocked and uh, very grateful that after the talk Professor Romano presented us this rare piece of hardware. Unfortunately, original software is lost, but we are crazy enough to one day recreate it. Besides this very model, the Institute of Cybernetics designed most of other expansion boards for ESPC series, and we had a chance to see some really interesting papers that gave us some further hints. I always say that Chernobyl is all about interesting details, hints and twisted stories. So, back in 1986, some scientists of the Cybernetic Institute and Cybernetic Center were members of the state task force, quickly created by Soviet government, to actually analyze the disaster and create some methods of dealing with it. It was led by Boris Sherbina, Ivan Silayev, and uh, also had some prominent scientists in it, such as uh, Valery Legasov from the Kurchatov Institute, Yevgeny Velikov, who was the head of the Academy of Science, and many others. So there is this famous shot where Velikov actually breaks uh, the glass uh, in a golden corridor of Chernobyl nuclear power plant to take inside the cable uh, with detectors that fell from a helicopter. And uh, such a coincidence, because in the papers that we have seen by Professor Romanov, uh, we saw the final act of the state tests uh, of the, one of the YES computers, new types of YES computers, that was also signed by Evgeny Velikov. In reality, there were many more user cases apart from the Jupiter plant, as it is possible to find certain references, for example in conference summaries such as Chernobyl 92, Chernobyl 94 and so on. 
Another thing, however, that the period of use of ESPC at the zone was relatively short because they quickly got replaced by the more sophisticated IBM PC machines, but this makes it even more interesting to trace back the historical detail. The next place we went was the Igor Sikorsky National University, the Kiev Polytechnic Institute. A major part of its campus was built with shiny white modernistic buildings from the 70s and 80s that look similar to those in Pripyat. At the older part, behind the beautiful main building, there is a complex of 19th century mechanical workshops. Now it is a home of the Boris Patton National Polytechnic Museum. This place is the only one in Ukraine where you can see such a massive collection of computer equipment of the past times. Here we were given an opportunity to learn more. This densely packed board is a digital signal input-output adapter. It's one more expansion type. It's been connected the same way as an analog one, but it has eight input and eight output channels. And the same as an analog one, it can be configured to transmit signals to external devices or to make the computer react on the change of the state of particular channel. So you could find uh, a way how to build an instrument control system on it. But all of this is good if you have just a few instruments, but if you need a lot of them, uh, then you may need so-called Kamak system. For those who do not know what is Kamak, it's a modular system of data acquisition where instruments shaped as unified models are installed in a, such a special crate. Uh, the biggest use Kamak got in nuclear physics, so needless to say, uh, it was and is widely used in Chernobyl. And here is a historical picture from the 90s, where a Kamak crate uh, was in the laboratory of the Echo Center State Enterprise, and here it is connected to IBM PS277. We actually didn't find a picture of Kamak used together with ES1841, despite such integration existed in the zone as well. But in the museum they shown us one more cool thing, which we have not seen before. This board, coded 0103, is the special adapter of so-called GPIP bus, or as it was called in the Soviet Union, a common use channel. The GPIB itself is a special interface for compatible instruments and measurement devices of virtually any kind. Given that after Chernobyl disaster a lot of technical help was given to the zone from foreign countries, this also got its use here. The adapter allows to program the operation of the instruments as well as the data exchange between them and the computer. And depending on the mode of the operation, a speed was from 50 to 200 kilobits per second. In fact, however, in many cases it was possible to use a current loop or RS-233 interface because the controller for them was more standard and hence widespread. That's how it looks like. Returning to our visit to the cybernetic center in Kiev, there we actually learned that there were two stages of production of the models. What you have seen before was the first one, but the second one, already coded with the letter E in their index, was made a little bit later. Among them are some interesting, such as signal generators, unified boards for analog and digital signals, and so on. But they were developed so close to the collapse of the Soviet Union that it looks that there were not so many actually produced. We've in fact never seen any of them physically, but if you find some reference in scientific journals, uh, we definitely will make an update video. When the Soviet Union collapsed, all of this very quickly went to decline. The Soviet personal computers were quickly uh, replaced with the Western PCs because they were more robust and more unified. And actually, this kind of ES1841 computers became very rare. But this is not the end of the story, because actually we have a tiny teaser for you. In our next video, we will show you this very machine powered on first time in 30 years, and we will show you how does it work. So stay tuned, subscribe to our channel, visit our Patreon page, and see you next video. Bye!